Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good morning, St. Albans. Good morning. I want to begin with a word of gratitude for the wonderful celebration we had here on Wednesday night, especially to Marianne and Jeff Sedlak, who are in the back. Thank you guys so much. They weren't here when I said that on Wednesday because they were working. And so their work really culminated in a wonderful event. Not only was I installed as rector, but we celebrated our patronal feast that day, the Feast of St. Albany, in style, too. We came together as one congregation, and we incorporated uh, worship and musical elements from all three of our services, 8, 9, 30, 5, 30. We had a party, great food and great music, and mirth. What happened here on Wednesday night was really a dream come true for me. Not only for me, but in my dream for this place. Because what we did together on Wednesday, in my, at least in my estimation, is what healthy churches ought to be doing once in a while. Getting together and having a party to celebrate each other, to be together and enjoy each other. And so my heart is full because of you, and because of that evening, and maybe because the bishop said some nice things about me. <laughs> but he also said nice things about you, didn't he? He said, St. Albans Church is the real deal. He held up a mirror to you, and he told you to be proud of the parish that you are. And I couldn't agree more. You should be proud, especially in light of all the storms you have weathered together in recent years. But there's a, a maxim that lives large in, in the lore of the athletic department at Holderness School, where I taught before I came here. Every coach of every sport at every level says this to every player during every practice and every game. Here's the maximum. Don't get happy. <laughs> it was coined by a legend at Holderness. His name is Norm Walker. He coached football for 30 years. And oh yeah, he was a poet and in the chair of the English department. A really interesting guy. Don't get happy. It's a way of saying, you know, if you're up by three touchdowns at halftime, so what? Don't get happy. Focus on finishing the game. If you make a great play, but your team is losing the game, or you're not giving your greatest effort, so what? Don't get happy. If your win-loss record is 10-0, but you still haven't won a single playoff game, guess what? Don't get happy. It's a way of saying, stay focused. And I mention that maxim because it seems fitting for us today. St. Albans is a fantastic parish. But I believe that we have so much more potential to unlock yet. I really believe that God is calling us to grow and develop a thriving ministry to our teenagers. And potentially to carve out a campus ministry for USM or an SMCC. To build an ever more robust adult education, faith education program, to become a center for spirituality in Southern Maine, to work towards powering our buildings with green energy. To develop a strategy for partnering with folks in our community who are already doing God's work of justice and mercy. And to raise up people of all ages who claim their ministries, not just on Sunday, but the rest of the week too. 
And we are doing these things already. And we should be proud of what we've accomplished. But don't get happy. <laughs> an occasion like an installation was for me up there with my graduations from college and seminary, or like my ordination. It was a big step in my own journey to follow a priestly calling. And it gave me a reason to stop and reflect on the last 15 years of my life since I became an Episcopalian. 15 years. And when I headed down the path of discerning this vocation into the priesthood, I remember one particular moment along that long path where I was interviewed by the Bishop of Connecticut to see whether or not I would be allowed to pursue ordination or not in the Diocese of Connecticut. Now that diocese at that time, I don't know anything about it now. At that time it was notorious for saying no thank you to most people. Or thanks for your call, we'll call you back in three years. There was no shortage of priests in Connecticut and there was certainly no one clamoring for more young, straight, white male priests. They had enough of those. So I was really nervous about this interview with the Bishop of Connecticut. And so I remember praying in the car all the way from New Haven to Hartford. Because this man held my life's path in his hands. He could just say no, and it would be over. Right? I was so scared I would say the wrong thing, I would say something dumb, I would get nervous. You get the picture. Every insecurity they could possibly have, I had in that moment. And so I just prayed for the Spirit to help me through. And I had no idea what he was going to ask me, but there's one question that I remember. He asked me a lot of things, but the one that I remember was this. He said, what is your least favorite passage in the Bible? <laughs> I thought, is this a trick? <laughs> Should I kind of dodge and deflect and say, oh, Bishop, I think all the passages in the Bible are excellent and we should follow them all. <laughs> sort of the Episcopal examination equivalent of saying in a job interview that your greatest weakness is that you work too hard, you know? <laughs> but the Spirit was with me, truly. The Spirit said, relax and tell the truth. And so the truth was, for a long time, I did have a least favorite passage of the Bible. It's the Gospel reading for today. And I told Bishop Smith, I just could not wrap my head around why Jesus would allow, would not allow a man to go and bury his father before following. That seems reasonable to me. Or why he wouldn't allow another man just to go say goodbye to his family. It seemed like a lot that Jesus was asking of people already to leave their families and all but a little harsh that he asked them to just abandon them in that very moment. And I told Bishop Smith this was easily my least favorite gospel reading because it runs counter to my understanding of how God is often present to us in the unconditional love that we know from our family members. And how it presents a picture of Jesus that's really hard to reconcile with the general sense that we get of him from reading the rest of the Gospels. And Bishop Smith just stared at him. He was quiet. And then he said, that's one of my least favorite readings. <laughs> And so I'll have to tell you that in that 15 year span, I have managed to avoid preaching on that passage <laughs> until today. Let the dead bury their own dead. The 
Yikes! Where is the good news in that? But when I started asking that question in earnest, where is the good news in that? Wouldn't you know that when you get curious about something and you pursue it a bit, you know, as though it's your job to speak in public about it, you actually do get some perspective and learn some things. And so I do. I read some commentaries. I looked at some different translations. I've dusted off the old Greek textbook that I've forgotten everything about. And I learned some things that maybe I knew one time but forgot. It's about this moment in the context of the Gospel of Luke. This moment in the Gospel of Luke is a major, major turning point. It's a hinge, a pivot point of the whole Gospel of Luke, like a climax, really. Because up until this point, Luke is providing background. He's introducing us to Jesus. He's telling us about how he was born, what it was like when he was a boy. He put him in the context of his time, he placed him in, in a relationship to the ministry of John the Baptist, establishing that maybe he's special, maybe he's something more than a prophet. And then that all culminates in the story that happens right before this reading, the transfiguration. So Jesus, you probably know the story, Jesus goes on the mountaintop and he is visited by Moses and Elijah, and he is transfigured before two of his disciples and for the reader. And we know in that moment what Luke has been introducing to us all the way up until that point. He's not merely a prophet or a teacher. This man is the Son of God. And we have no doubt now who his true identity, what his true identity really is. Jesus is the embodied fulfillment of all the law, Moses, and all the prophets, Elijah. And their stories shed light on what Jesus is about to go do in this pivot moment. And it's so cool, some of the stuff I learned, that just as Moses and Elijah, you might know this, they're the only two Old Testament figures who didn't die. Both of them at the end of their lives are taken up. And we just read the passage where Elijah is taken up into heaven. Taken up into heaven, alive. The only two are Moses and Elijah. And look how this reading starts. It starts with the sentence, when the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up. And the audience of this gospel would have known and recognized that Luke is putting Jesus not just on the plane with Moses and Elijah, but above Moses and Elijah. And that ought to get our attention. You see what's going on. Jesus is not only going to lead the exodus, and he's not only going to cast down the wicked, he's going to do all of it and fulfill all of it. And so being his being taken up is a way of saying his ascension. And everything that leads up to it, his death and the resurrection, it was all part of the mission that starts right now in the narrative of, of the Gospel of Luke. God is going to, Luke reveals who Jesus is and then sets it to his primary task. God is going to fulfill the Old Testament law and prophets and do something big and bold and new starting in chapter 9, verse 52. And this is the moment where Jesus sets out to do it, where he, quote, turns to set his face toward Jerusalem. That's the mission that he chose to accept. That's why he's so serious. A more literal translation of that phrase is offered by one scholar is that he, quote, hardened his face to go to Jerusalem. So I think the kids 
the kids who are here this morning, they know what that means. Can I see your hardened faces, kids? You, you know what I'm talking about. When you're early on a Monday morning when you want to sleep in, but you got to go to school, and you got to harden your face to get up and do that mission. You gain faith. Grown-ups know this, don't we? Maybe we have a really difficult or unpleasant conversation that we cannot avoid. And so we steal our nerves. We take a deep breath. And we harden our face. And we do what we have to do. We say what we have to say. And that's the pivot point of the Gospel of Luke. Right there. Jesus is resolved. It's the climax of the narrative when you know that Jesus is going for it. He's all in. There will be no backing away from who he is now that we know who he is. It's the moment of decision and focus. Jesus had a great day on the mountain with some Bible heroes, but he's not getting happy. And so chapters 10 through 18 of Luke are scenes from his long journey toward the cross in Jerusalem. Like a hero's epic, a prophet's journey to speaking truth to power, Jerusalem is where the power is. And so Jesus, the truth embodied, sets off on a collision course with power. And then the rest of the gospel, chapters 19 to 24, is just about the outcome of that collision of truth and power. And it recounts the story of Jesus' death, his resurrection, and his ascension. This is the moment where the whole thing starts to unfold towards the direction it's going. With his game face on. Jesus did not get happy. Because he knew this work would not be easy, that this work would require his resolve, his focus. It would require inner strength, single-mindedness, and a fortitude that cannot be matched by mere morals. So saying yes to this mission to Jerusalem literally meant saying no to everything else. In this moment of decision, there would be an intolerance for anything that distracted from this most urgent and important task. And so this accounts for Jesus being so unaccommodating with those who were a bit more casual about following him. Jesus responds with urgency and a demand for decisiveness. He says, if you want to follow me, do it now or don't. If you want to live in the kingdom, start now. Don't wait until later. This is serious business. Don't get happy. Now, I don't believe anymore that Jesus failed to love those people. I think he was simply being in fact in this moment of decision. I am sure of it, that Jesus wants us to go to our dad's funeral if we have the chance. And I'm sure that Jesus wants us to say the good, our goodbyes to our family members if that comes up. After all, Jesus said goodbye to his friend at the last supper. But I think he was just locked in to a different spiritual frequency in this scene. And he knew that they wouldn't be able to keep up with him. And so he sent them away. Like when a restaurant tells you that it's going to be a three hour wait <laughs> just so you'll leave. Not many of us are willing to wait the three hours. And very, very few of us can follow Jesus 
all the way to Jerusalem. We still have reservations when it comes to following Jesus, don't we? Well, most of us. We have issues with Jesus' timeline, and we want to negotiate the terms of our following, don't we? We want to retain control, and we can't often find the strength to carry out what he's asking of us because the bar is so high. And that's where grace comes in. Grace says, in no uncertain terms, you will live more abundantly if you choose Jesus right this second. That is true. But grace also says that God still loves you if you need more time to work up to it. That is also true. And you know, most of the scenes in the Bible, Jesus is accommodating, and most of the time, Jesus accommodates us. But I do believe there are moments in the life of discipleship when the call to follow Jesus comes to us with a degree of urgency. Times when we have to make decisions to do the right thing, right then. To speak up on the right thing, right then, to show up, right then. Because in those moments, even if they're rare, it's all on the line, whether our commitment to Jesus is real or not. Two examples. Brad Hendrickson from our Eventide congregation heard that urgent call back in March. And so he quit his job and bought a one-way plane ticket to Europe. And he hitchhiked to Ukraine and has spent the last three months evacuating senior citizens out of the war zones in the eastern region of Ukraine. He's been driving a sprinter van from the Donbas region into Romania on a daily basis for three months. He sends me photos of where he is, and the little bombs are all around his location, the warning on the map. He's evacuated scores of people from senior homes out of bomb zones into safety. And he told me right before he left that he was crystal clear that Jesus was calling him to go and defend the defenseless to go and protect those who had no protection, and that his faith simply would not survive refusing to answer his call. Another example. This man at the organ bench, who was feeling well enough to be here, thank you, so glad you're here. He left a full-time tenure-track college professorship for this part-time job at church. And I can't imagine that it was for the money. <laughs> but Hinta said that he felt called to be here. And we felt the same thing about him. And I'll never forget what he said in my kitchen when he was here for his interview. He said, if I have truly discerned that God has called me here, and if the church feels the same way, then I don't go through with it. What good is my faith at all? Do you remember that? I said, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> now, I love St. Albans Church, and I want to be your priest for a long time. But part of my job is once in a while, to look at you and say, don't get happy. Get serious for a minute and ask yourself, what is calling you urgently? How is Jesus saying to you, drop what you're doing and follow me into fuller life? 
How might Jesus be asking you to rearrange your priorities or to get serious about serving and following? These are the questions of discipleship. And I pray that you'll listen.